You are listening to an AI narrated, full cozy mystery audiobook. If you'd rather read this novella, you find the link to purchase a copy in the description under this video. Chapter 1 Bitsy handed her sister in law, Liz, a sample of the latest flavor to hit the bakery case in the bake shop. What do you think? she asked. I'm thinking just a touch more caramel drizzle over the banana cream frosting. I don't think it can be improved upon, Liz said. Where did you get the idea to whip bananas into the cream frosting? Three mornings ago, I woke up at 4 a.m. with Max pawing at my head, and while I was trying to calm him down with some kibble, it just came to me. Poor Max. Once again, Max's semi-annual trip to the vet had culminated in a lecture from Dr. Ames that Max was too fat. That was how he came to be on reduced rations of svelte kitty kibble, but it didn't seem to be working. The poor cat was constantly hungry, and, like his owner, being hungry made him irritable. Maybe Max should consider waking you up in the wee hours of the morning more often, Liz said. That frosting is absolutely perfect. Lots of other people thought so, too. By the end of the day, they'd sold all six dozen banana cream cupcakes and gotten two custom orders for an additional six dozen for a function the following day. Those banana cream cupcakes were a real hit. Annabel, one of Bitsy's bakers, said as she collected her bag from the hook by the back door. Is Nick still closing up out front? Bitsy asked. He was, but there was one last-minute customer. When Bitsy stuck her head out the door of the kitchen to see if the tardy customer had departed, she was greeted with yelling. I want to see your boss. A petite woman in her mid-sixties was wagging her finger in Nick's face with such vigor that her bleached blonde bouffant wig shifted on her head, and her dangly rhinestone earrings swung back and forth like the crystals on a chandelier after a minor earthquake. I'm sorry, Nick told the irate woman as he backed out of reach of her index finger. Bitsy left for the evening. Perhaps, I can help you. Nick was lying, he knew Bitsy had not left for the evening. In fact, he was driving her home, and they were going to have dinner together and watch a little TV. Dealing with complaints, not that there were many, upset Bitsy. Even before Nick and Bitsy had become an item, as Liz put it, Nick had done his best to shield her from unsatisfied customers. How can I help you? Bitsy said, approaching the woman who'd moved on from wagging her finger in Nick's face to striking a cafe table with her frail fist so hard that it wobbled on its spindly metal legs. The collection of enameled bangles on her wrist jangled together as she raised her fist a second time and brought it down on the tabletop. Are you Bitsy? the woman demanded, turning her heavily shadowed eyes onto Bitsy and twisting her crimson painted lips into what was supposed to stand in for a smile, but wasn't. I am Bitsy and you are? You stole my recipe. The woman was practically screaming now. Bitsy hoped the frail woman didn't collapse in a fit of rage right there on the tiled floor next to the bakery case. I don't understand, Bitsy said, looking helplessly over at Nick. Nick shrugged. He appeared to be just as clueless as Bitsy was over the source of the woman's outrage. You stole my famous banana cream frosting recipe, the woman screeched at Bitsy. Don't you know who I am? Have we met? Bitsy asked. She'd have remembered meeting this woman for sure, and even if she didn't remember the woman, surely, she'd remember stealing someone else's banana cream frosting recipe. I'm Ingrid Morrison, the woman said, clearly expecting that to mean something to her audience. It meant nothing to Bitsy, but Nick said, you're the cookbook lady. Ingrid seemed slightly mollified by Nick's acknowledgement of her status as a cookbook authoress. That banana cream frosting recipe is set to appear in my latest edition of the Baker's Guide to Icings and Frostings, said Ingrid. Set to appear? Bitsy asked. It hasn't been published yet? It will be in bookstores next month. The name Ingrid Morrison rang a faint bell in the back of Bitsy's mind. She thought that Liz might have mentioned that the town of Little Creek had a celebrity chef in their midst at some point. If Bitsy remembered correctly, Liz had implied that Ingrid Morrison was a bit of a faded celebrity. According to Liz, Ingrid had been very big on cooking shows in the 90s. Liz had said quite a lot more about Ingrid, but Bitsy couldn't recall most of it. However, the general tenor of the conversation had been that Liz was not a fan of Ingrid Morrison. How could I have stolen your recipe if the book hasn't even been published yet? Bitsy demanded. 
Surely, Ingrid Morrison was not so delusional as to suggest that Bitsy had snuck into Ingrid's house and taken an unauthorized peek at her manuscript. As it turned out, Ingrid had already worked out a scenario for how Bitsy must have acquired her prize signature recipe for the banana cream frosting. Marcia gave it to you, Ingrid said. I know she did. A cloying cloud of perfume, which smelled like a mixture of roses and baby powder with hints of turpentine, dissipated off the irate woman. It overpowered the bakery smells, the cherry cupcakes just out of the oven, the chocolate-glazed cupcakes newly added to the bakery case, and the freshly whipped banana cream frosting setting in the enormous mixer bowl, ready to go on the batch of banana nut cupcakes still in the oven. The addition of Ingrid's perfume was not an improvement. Who is Marcia? Bitsy asked. Bitsy looked over at Nick. He was trying to mouth something back at her over the top of Ingrid's head, but she couldn't quite make out what it was. Your sitter? Bitsy guessed, although why an apparently able-bodied woman in her sixties would need a sitter eluded her. Ingrid was frail, but very much moving under her own power. Perhaps, Ingrid's mind had gone, and that was why she needed someone to look after her, although Bitsy had never heard a caregiver for a grown person referred to as a sitter. Marcia is my sister. Ingrid said, stepping forward as if she intended to take a swing at Bitsy. Ingrid might be small, but she was wearing several enormous cocktail rings on her skinny little fingers. Getting hit by Ingrid would definitely hurt. She might even draw blood. Bitsy stepped back until she was plastered against the bakery case. Marcia is my twin sister, Ingrid said, a trifle more calmly as she lowered her hands to her sides. She's always out to get me. She's so jealous of me that she tries to ruin everything. I've never met your sister, Bitsy insisted. I didn't steal your banana cream frosting recipe, and no one gave it to me. I knew you'd deny it, said Ingrid. Well, I'll make you regret this. Then she was gone, as fast as her bird-like legs could carry her. What was that? Bitsy asked Nick after she'd collapsed into the nearest chair. That was Ingrid Morrison, Nick said. I figured you'd have met the sweet and sour twins by now. Bitsy had been back in Little Creek for nearly a year now, but she'd yet to encounter these sweet and sour twins. I'm guessing Ingrid is the sour one. You could say that. How could I have missed such a character? The Morrison twins usually keep to themselves, said Nick. They live over on Elm Street. That was only two blocks over from Bitsy's little cottage. They live together? Bitsy asked. That must be a life of misery for them both. No, they have houses next door to each other. They've lived side by side since the early 80s. Married? Ingrid had a man living with her for years, but neither of them ever married. And Marcia is sweet? Mousy is a better word to describe her, in my opinion, Nick said. So, nothing like Ingrid? Not that I've observed. It always seemed to me that Marcia lived in her sister's shadow. My grandfather had a thing for her for a while. For Marcia? No, Ingrid. Ingrid doesn't seem like Roscoe's type, said Bitsy. She and Grandad were both much younger then. I don't remember Ingrid being quite so over the top when I was a kid. What do you think Ingrid is plotting in revenge? Bitsy asked. Who knows, said Nick. But I guess we'll soon find out. Except they didn't have a chance to find out because the very next morning, tragedy struck the Morrison twins, and the surviving sister had no time to take revenge on the supposed theft of her prize banana cream frosting recipe. Chapter 2 The neighbor found Marcia Morrison lying at the bottom of her basement stairs this morning, Liz told Bitsy, but Stan thinks she'd been dead for quite a while when the neighbor found her. Did he take the call? Bitsy asked. Bitsy and Liz were sitting in a booth at Bub's diner. Bitsy's brother Stan was supposed to be having lunch with them, instead, he was filling in down at the Little Creek Police Department. Stan and Liz had retired together, or at least that had been the plan. Liz had sold the bakery to Bitsy, hoping to embark on a life of leisure and travel. Liz had gotten the leisure part, if one counted puttering around in the garden and doing crossword puzzles as leisure, but the travel had never materialized. Stan had stayed on reserve with the police force because the Little Creek Police Department was chronically short-staffed. 
Stan did take the call, Liz said shortly. Her husband's workload was a perpetual sore spot with Liz. Where is Stan now? Who knows? Did Stan seem to think Marcia's death was an accident? Bitsy asked. I don't think there was any reason to think otherwise. When you're as frail as Marcia Morrison, I imagine falling down a long steep flight of stairs and hitting your head on the concrete cellar floor might easily be fatal. She's not a young woman either. She's not more than five years older than you, Bitsy pointed out. Liz bristled a little of that and mumbled something about having taken better care of herself. It was true, Bitsy supposed. She couldn't imagine Liz expiring from a simple fall down the stairs. Of course, much younger and stronger people than Marcia Morrison had died as a result of a bad fall. It could happen to anyone. You said the neighbor found her? Bitsy asked Liz. Todd McPherson found her. Marcia's poodle, Fifi, showed up in his backyard. When Todd tried to return Fifi to Marcia and couldn't get anyone to answer the door, he became concerned. Did he go inside before calling the police? I don't know, said Liz, and I'm not answering any more of your questions, even if I do know the answers. Why not? Because you meddle. Liz still seemed miffed at Bitsy's pointing out that she was in nearly the same age bracket as the sweet and sour twins, but Bitsy didn't feel like mollifying her sister-in-law. I don't meddle, Bitsy insisted. I investigate. Well, you don't need to investigate every tragic accident that happens, said Liz, and this was clearly just that. Their pulled pork had arrived, and Bitsy let the matter rest. It wasn't just the low blow Bitsy had made about Liz's age that had her sister-in-law refusing to humor Bitsy with answers to her curious questions. When Bitsy got to investigating, Stan invariably got tangled up in things. Liz just wanted a quiet retirement doing normal retired people things like going to flea markets and golfing and pancake dinners at the Lions Club. Instead, at Bitsy's instigation, there'd been several recent incidents where Stan had gotten sucked into tracking down murderers and kidnappers and serial fraudsters. That was not Liz's idea of a good time. Saturday afternoon, three days after Marcia was found at the bottom of her basement stairs, most of Little Creek came out for her funeral. Not much went on in Little Creek on a normal weekend, so it was standing room only at the tiny clabbered Baptist church that the sweet and sour twins had attended all their lives. It was a closed casket service. There were whispers that poor Marcia's head had been completely smashed in, therefore rendering her body unfit for viewing, but later on, after the funeral, when Bitsy questioned him, Stan insisted that Marcia had suffered only a minor head wound. Clearly, the blow had been sufficient to kill her, but there hadn't even been much bleeding. The rumors floating around about the condition of Marcia Morrison's body would have been more in line with her having been bludgeoned to death. Stan assured Bitsy that this was not the case. Really? Really? Falls are the second leading cause of accidental death, right after traffic accidents. But what if Marcia's fall wasn't accidental? Bitsy persisted. Stan was probably right, but whenever her older brother lectured her, Bitsy invariably got defensive. There's absolutely nothing to suggest it wasn't an accident, Stan said. There wasn't, but Bitsy couldn't leave well enough alone. It wasn't something she liked about herself, but arguing with Stan invariably turned her into someone more closely resembling a bratty ten-year-old than a dignified middle-aged woman. Ingrid didn't seem very broken up about losing her sister, Bitsy said. At the funeral, Bitsy had chosen a seat where she could clearly see the remaining twin, who'd worn a sparkly black cocktail dress and pinned a black pillbox hat, complete with a net veil, to her bouffant blonde wig. Not once during the entire service had Bitsy detected any sign of tears, although, in Ingrid's defense, it was hard to tell what was going on underneath that veil. It doesn't surprise me that Ingrid isn't grief-stricken, said Liz. There's been bad blood between those two for years. Why live next door to each other, then? They snagged two of the nicest Victorians in Little Creek, said Liz. I don't imagine either of them were inclined to give the other the satisfaction of moving out to an inferior house. If Marcia's place goes on the market, I intend to be first in line to make an offer. Judging by the look on Stan's face, this was the first he'd heard of any scheme to get a hold of the late Morrison twins' house, but after the shock faded, he didn't appear opposed to the idea. 
As it turned out, Liz got her chance to get a look at the house sooner rather than later. The Wednesday after Marsha's funeral, Liz called Bitsy just as she was taking a pan of banana spice cupcakes out of the oven and told her that Marsha's house had just hit the market. Zoe called me and gave me a heads up since I'd already expressed interest, said Liz. Zoe? The Morrison twins' niece. She's a real estate agent. There'd been a young woman sitting next to Ingrid at the funeral. Bitsy wondered if that had been Zoe. You want to do a walkthrough with me? Liz asked. Stan busy? He's working again. If I still think it's a good idea to make an offer after seeing the condition of the place, he'll do another walkthrough with me tomorrow. Bitsy didn't have to be asked twice. She checked with Annabel and Nick to make sure they were good to close on their own and then arranged to meet Liz at the house at four. Bitsy arrived at Marsha Morrison's rambling Victorian half an hour early. She wanted to snoop, and she had the perfect alibi if she should be caught sticking her nose in where it wasn't wanted. She was there to look over the house on behalf of a potential buyer. As Bitsy got out of the car, she glanced next door at Ingrid's house. Marsha and Ingrid's house, while slightly different in design, had clearly been built in the same era, and both by people of means. Both houses were huge. At one time, the houses must have looked nearly identical. Now, the difference couldn't have been more stark. While Marsha's house was painted a quiet cream, which was peeling in places, Ingrid's was a complex combination of purples, pinks, and greens. Whoever had been tasked with painting all that gingerbread on Ingrid's house must have been at the job for weeks. The landscaping schemes were also quite a contrast. Marcia had restricted herself to a neatly mown patch of grass surrounded by a border of rose bushes in pinks and yellows. Ingrid's place was a profusion of statuary, mostly concrete angels and cupids and the occasional terracotta bunny. There were also at least a dozen wishing balls and several bird baths surrounded by overgrown flowering azaleas just beginning to bloom. Bitsy tore her gaze away from the riot of color in Ingrid's yard and opened the gate on the weather-beaten picket fence that led to Marcia's front walk. She stood on the worn painted boards of the porch that wrapped around the side of the house and rang the doorbell. She wasn't expecting an answer, and she didn't get one. Bitsy looked around for Zoe but decided that if Zoe had been waiting at the curb, she surely would have waylaid her potential buyer by now. Bitsy decided against trying the front door, and she ignored the lockbox hanging from the knob, instead, she walked around the side of the house. She knocked at the back door and again got no answer. She opened the screen door and tried the knob. It turned easily. Someone had left it unlocked. Bitsy stepped into the kitchen and shut the door behind her. She'd have plenty of time to explore the rest of the house in the company of Liz and Zoe, but she didn't anticipate either of them being inclined to linger in the basement, much less examine the patch of cement floor where Marcia had met her maker. That was something Bitsy was eager to get out of the way in solitude. If Marcia's house was like most old houses of the era, the stairs to the basement likely originated in the kitchen. The large, sunny, old-fashioned kitchen, which looked to have last been updated in the 1970s with avocado green countertops and harvest gold appliances, was every bit as neat and tidy as the yard had been. Bitsy tried one of the several closed doors along one interior wall, but it turned out to be a half-empty pantry but orderly pantry containing mostly baking supplies. She tried another and discovered a cobbled-together powder room with a Pepto-Bismol pink sink. The third door Bitsy tried was the one leading to the basement stairs. Bitsy crept down the stairs as if trying to keep her presence concealed, but halfway down, she felt pretty silly about it. There was no reason to believe she was not alone in the house. At the bottom of the stairs, she found a switch and turned on the light. A bank of fluorescent bulbs flooded the space. Bitsy didn't know what she was looking for, so she started with the foot of the stairs where Marcia's body had been found the day she'd died. As Bitsy had expected, she found a faint rusty red spot on the concrete, which she guessed was where Marcia's head wound had bled onto the floor. Bitsy bent down to take a closer look. The spot looked like it had been scrubbed, and the whole area smelled of pine cleaner. There was nothing suspicious about that. Everyone in town knew that someone had died at the bottom of those stairs, but she doubted Zoe was too keen on leaving the bloodstain intact for potential buyers to dwell on. Bitsy looked around and saw a jug of pine cleaner and a bottle of baby oil sitting next to a trash can. 
The trash can was empty, but there was a small white plastic garbage bag, neatly tied off, next to it. Bitsy carefully untied the top of the bag and gingerly picked through the contents using the handle of a fly swatter she discovered hanging from a nail on the wall nearby. There wasn't much in the trash bag, just some paper towels that smelled strongly of the pine cleaner and were stained from cleaning up the remnants of the blood. Oddly, one of the most heavily stained of the paper towels looked like it had been used earlier to wipe up spills of bright tempera paint or sidewalk chalk or something. There were just a few smears of pink and green, but it seemed odd to Bitsy. Had Marcia been babysitting some kids who liked to draw on the basement floor? She looked around for evidence of chalk drawings on the floor and found none. Of course, the whole place was neat as a pin, so it was likely that the entire basement had been mopped in advance of showing the house to potential buyers. Bitsy surveyed the rest of the basement, which, unlike most people's basements, was neat, orderly, and virtually empty save shelves lining the walls filled with jars of canned fruit and garden produce. Near the trash can was a stack of cardboard pizza box tops, neatly bundled for recycling. This seemed odd until Bitsy decided that the bottoms of the boxes must have been discarded as unsuitable for recycling since they'd become stained with oil from the crusts. By the looks of the bundles of broken-down boxes, Marcia could have kept Pietro's pizza in business all on her own. One pizza box had not been broken down and lay propped against the pile of bundled box tops. Bitsy opened the box and found an entire pizza inside. The pizza looked like it had been dropped on the floor and then put back into the box, which might explain why it had remained uneaten. Other than pizza boxes, the only other recycling was an old refrigerator box that had been cut into pieces and stuffed into a black plastic garbage bag. In one corner, there were three old-fashioned wooden wardrobes. Bitsy walked over and looked inside. Two were filled with women's clothes, the third was empty. There were a washer and dryer in the other corner. Bitsy looked inside both, but they appeared not to have been used for a while. She picked up the mop sitting in the old concrete utility sink, but other than smelling strongly of pine cleaner, it was just an ordinary mop. Bitsy went back to the spot at the foot of the stairs and shone the light from her phone around under the bottom step for no other reason than she'd run out of other things to look at. Something glittered under the bottom step, and Bitsy fished it out. It was a dangly rhinestone earring, an exact match to the pair Ingrid had been wearing when she'd stormed into the bakery and accused Bitsy of stealing her banana cream frosting recipe. Bitsy was still holding the earring in her hand when she heard footsteps overhead. She was trying to figure out a way to announce her presence to Zoe and Liz without coming off as a crazy snooper when she heard a man's voice say, Did you leave the light on in the basement? No, a woman's voice replied. I haven't been here since yesterday, and I'm sure I turned it off and closed the door. It might be Zoe up there in the kitchen, but it certainly wasn't Liz who was with her. Bitsy flung the earring back under the bottom step and darted over to the empty antique wardrobe before softly closing herself inside. Chapter 3 Bitsy had not concealed her presence any too soon. Just as she was pulling the door to the wardrobe shut, leaving a tiny crack to look through, a pair of men's work-booted feet appeared at the top of the stairs. The man belonging to the boots descended into the basement, followed by Zoe. Bitsy recognized Zoe as the young woman who had been sitting next to Ingrid at the funeral, but the man was unfamiliar. I'm sure I turned this light off, Zoe insisted. Well, I'm sure I wasn't the one who left it on, the man shot back. Really, Joe? Zoe said. You were the one who left the back door unlocked. You already admitted to it. Which means if I'd left the light on, I would have admitted to that, too. Well, it was probably Auntie who came over to poke around in the basement. You know how she is. If she came to poke around, why didn't she take this trash with her? Joe asked. I told her we'd take care of it. I thought that would be safer. Well, I wish somebody would. This whole thing is making me nervous. There's nothing to be nervous about, said Zoe. None of us did anything wrong, not really. Joe lapsed into a brooding silence as he picked up the bag of cut-up cardboard and the small bag of refuse. Shall I take the pizza boxes, too, he asked. I don't see any reason to. I can put them out for recycling next week. I hope all this turns out to have been worth it, said Joe. Of course, it will be worth it. Anything is worth the chance to be together. 
I think we ought to just tell everyone about us, Zoe said as she idly straightened the already orderly rows of canned goods. Bitsy hoped Zoe didn't decide to start absently opening and closing the doors of the antique wardrobes. If she did that, they were all in for a nasty surprise. There was no reasonable explanation Bitsy could come up with for why she was hiding inside a cupboard in Marsha's basement and eavesdropping. No, said Joe so loudly that Bitsy started and nearly gave away her location. It's not the right time to tell Kristen about us. Why not? Zoe demanded, her voice rising. You promised you'd leave Kristen sooner or later. Just as soon as I've got that money in my pocket, we can go anywhere. We can leave this backwater behind and start a whole new life together. Bitsy didn't get a chance to listen in on the conclusion of the argument because there wasn't any conclusion. Upstairs, there was a ringing from the doorbell, and Zoe said, they're here. I'd better go, said Joe. Yes, you'd better. Go out the back and make sure you burn that box. Joe went up first, with Zoe close at his heels. Bitsy heard the screen door on the back porch slapping shut. As she crept up the basement stairs hoping the old treads wouldn't creak and give her away, she could hear Zoe's footfalls as she crossed the living room to the front door. Once Bitsy made it to the kitchen unobserved, she breathed easier. She'd go out in the backyard and wander around until somebody noticed her. Arriving early for a house showing and wandering around the yard was a perfectly normal thing to do, unlike sneaking inside and hiding in a cupboard in the cellar. Fortunately, nobody knew about that and she wasn't about to admit to it, not even to Liz or Nick. As it turned out, Bitsy's presence in the backyard attracted attention right away, just not from Liz or Zoe. Hello, there, said a voice over the fence. Bitsy had been leaning down to smell the blooms on a rose bush, and she nearly pitched forward into the thorns. She looked up. It was Marcia's next-door neighbor. You must be Todd. I'm Bitsy. Are you thinking of buying the place? Todd asked. My brother and sister-in-law are, said Bitsy. Shame about Marcia, said Todd. I'll never forget the sight of her lying there. Todd seemed to be rather relishing his part in the macabre tale. He didn't seem too awfully broken up about losing his next-door neighbor to a tragic accident. You were the one who found her? Bitsy asked. She already knew the answer to that question, but she was eager to get Todd to talk not that he appeared to be the sort that needed much encouragement. Poor thing had been dead for hours when I found her, said Todd. There was no saving her when she'd gone cold. I heard you were bringing Marcia's dog back. Fifi likes to climb under the fence and visit my basset hound, Henry. Usually, she goes back home on her own. But that day, Fifi didn't? No, and it's a good thing, too, because heaven knows how long Marcia would have laid there. Don't you think Ingrid would have noticed that her sister wasn't out and about? Bitsy asked. Those two don't take much interest in each other's business, said Todd, besides, Ingrid had already been by that morning. I saw Ingrid out in her backyard, taking in the morning sun just after seven when I let Henry out to do his business. Ingrid must have decided to go over to her sister's just after that. They aren't close like twins normally are, but I wouldn't call them estranged. Oh, you saw Ingrid going or coming from Marcia's house? Nope, I smelled her. Smelled her? When I came into the house to check on Marcia, I could smell Ingrid's perfume in the air. Ingrid certainly does have a distinctive scent. Distinctive was an understatement. You smelled Ingrid's scent in the house? Bitsy asked. She could imagine that if Ingrid had recently been to visit her sister that the smell of her perfume might linger in the air in every room she'd been in for hours. I didn't smell Ingrid's perfume upstairs, said Todd. But it was really strong in the basement. Bitsy would have liked to have asked Todd a lot more about his discovery of Marcia's body, but they were interrupted by Liz coming out the back door and waving Bitsy inside for a tour of the house. The viewing of the house itself was anticlimactic. Marcia's house was more or less as Bitsy had expected, neat and a little threadbare. Marcia's hobbies appeared confined to growing roses, baking, canning, and needlepoint. She completely lacked the flamboyance of her more famous sister. Everything about Marcia seemed faded and a bit colorless, right down to the curtains at the windows. Well, what do you think? Liz asked as they loitered next to their cars at the curb. 
is it worth having Stan come back to take a look? I think it's a great house, Bitsy told her. It just needs a bit of sprucing up. That's what I thought, too, said Liz. I intend to not let this one slip through my fingers. Did you see that asking price? I did. It seemed very reasonable. Reasonable? It's an absolute steal. Chapter 4 For days, Bitsy heard nothing more about the sale of the late Morrison twins' house or her unfortunate demise, but Liz stopped by the bakery around noon the following Monday and announced that she and Stan had made an offer on the old Victorian. We're optimistic that Zoe will accept our offer, Liz said. She seems very motivated to sell. Zoe? I thought she was just the listing agent. She inherited the house from her aunt, said Liz. The house didn't go to Ingrid? No, it's my understanding that Marcia left everything to her niece. And there's still no talk that Marcia's death might not be anything more than a tragic accident? I wish you wouldn't see evil lurking around every corner, said Liz. You do know you have an absurdly dark view of human nature. Bitsy did know, but she couldn't help it when her all is not as it seems radar went on high alert. Let me know when your offer is accepted, she told Liz. I will, she said, and Stan wants you to call him. About what? He wouldn't say. Liz's birthday was coming up. Bitsy figured that Stan probably wanted a woman's input on picking out a gift. Stan did want a woman's input, but, as it turned out, his concern had absolutely nothing to do with his wife's upcoming birthday. Bitsy called Stan mid-afternoon, right before heading home. She'd come in earlier that morning than usual. Hector, her morning baker, had called in sick because he had a kid with a stomach bug he needed to stay home with, so she and Nick had done the morning bake. The two of them combined were still slower than Hector in getting pans of cupcakes in and out of the ovens. Bitsy never stopped being grateful that when she'd bought the bakery from Liz, the staff, Nick, Annabel, and Hector, had all agreed to stay on. You need help picking out a birthday present for Liz? Bitsy asked her brother when he picked up. I do, actually, said Stan, but that's not why I wanted to talk to you. Why do you want to talk to me? I was just wondering if you poked around in Marsha Morrison's house when you and Liz went there to do that first walkthrough without me. What would make you think I'd poke around in Marsha Morrison's house? Bitsy demanded. Because it would be a temptation too great to resist. Are you saying you didn't? I might have. Liz said you got there before her. I did. What did you do while you were waiting for the realtor to arrive? Bitsy bristled a little at Stan's line of questioning. One might think I was a suspect, Bitsy said. Marsha Morrison was safely in the ground by the time I ever set foot in her house. The only thing I suspect you of is snooping, but you might have noticed something out of the ordinary. Are you boys in blue backtracking on Marsha Morrison's death being just the result of a tragic accident? Officially, no, but there's been an interesting development. Which is? I'm not authorized to release the details of an investigation to members of the public. Oh, so there is an investigation now. Not officially. So, unofficially, there's an investigation now. All right, unofficially, I can tell you there's an unofficial investigation into the circumstances surrounding the death of Marsha Morrison. There's not nearly enough evidence to issue any search warrants, but if you noticed anything suspicious, you could tell me, unofficially, of course. Well, said Bitsy, I did notice a few things I thought were a little odd. Bitsy told Stan about the cleaning supplies and the dirty paper towels in the trash, she told him about finding what she believed to be Ingrid's earring under the bottom tread of the basement stairs, then she told him about Eve's dropping on the conversation between Zoe and the man who'd accompanied her down to the basement. You really hid in an antique wardrobe and listened in? Stan seemed to find this outrageous, even by Bitsy's standards. Aren't you glad I did? Not really. I don't find anything you overheard likely to be significant. Nothing was said that points conclusively to any wrongdoing. What about Zoe's admonition to Joe to burn the cardboard? I'll admit that does seem like she wants to destroy evidence, but evidence of what? You looked at that cardboard. It's not as if it was covered with blood or something. I still think it's suspicious. 
The only thing that conversation you overheard really revealed was that Zoe and Joe are having an affair and that Zoe wants Joe to leave his wife so they can leave town and start a new life together like that's really going to happen. You don't think it will? Joe's stringing her along, said Stan. It's crystal clear that he has no intention of leaving Kristen. His type never does. Bitsy grudgingly admitted that Stan was probably right. It had occurred to her at the time that Joe might be stringing Zoe along with endless promises that he always found an excuse to weasel out of. Bitsy had a very low opinion of cheaters. Her ex-husband, Robert, had been a cheater, and she had no doubt that, eventually, Robert would cheat on his current wife, too. She also firmly believed that anyone who acted without integrity in one area of their life would act without integrity in all the others if the stakes were high enough. I'm not saying I believe Zoe had anything to do with her aunt's death, Bitsy said, but she does seem very eager to get her hands on the proceeds of the sale of Marcia's house. That may be callous, but certainly not criminal, said Stan. She did inherit the house after her aunt's death, but it's possible she didn't even know it was coming to her. Bitsy wanted to point out that it was hardly unknown for the beneficiaries of a deceased person's will to have hurried along the demise of their near and dear to get their hands on what was coming to them. However, Zoe's statement to Joe that they hadn't done anything wrong seemed to preclude that either of them had bumped Marcia off. On the other hand, humans were capable of justifying almost anything to themselves if the stakes were high enough. There's one more thing that you should probably look into, Bitsy told her brother. What is it? That neighbor of Marcia's, the one who found her dead at the bottom of the stairs when he brought over her poodle? Yes. He told me he smelled Ingrid's perfume lingering in the air. It is well known that Ingrid's perfume does have a tendency to linger, said Stan. Bitsy imagined anyone who'd ever met Ingrid knew that. There's something else, Bitsy said. What? Todd said the smell was much stronger down in the basement. Maybe Ingrid was hiding in that antique wardrobe? Stan suggested. He was joking, but it was too obvious a scenario to rule out. Well, if Ingrid was hiding in the wardrobe when Todd found the body, Bitsy told Stan, the smell had definitely dissipated by the time I was in there. All I smelled inside that wardrobe was mothballs. Bitsy didn't bother asking Stan if he'd smelled the lingering scent of Ingrid's perfume when he'd been called to the scene. Stan was notorious for being unable to detect smells that she and Liz found overwhelming. After Bitsy hung up with Stan, she felt a bit deflated. She told her brother everything she knew and gotten not even a scrap of new information in return. Bitsy decided it was time she made a condolence call on Ingrid Morrison. She could combine it with an apology and a peace offering. She didn't really expect Ingrid to pursue her grievances regarding Bitsy's supposed recipe theft, but it couldn't hurt to placate the woman a little, not when Bitsy had another more compelling reason to visit Ingrid. She wanted to know where the woman had been when her twin had tumbled down the basement stairs to her death. There had to be a reason one of the earrings that Ingrid had been wearing the day previous to Marcia's death had ended up under the bottom tread of Marcia's basement stairs. When Bitsy rang Ingrid's front doorbell, she was immediately greeted by the barking of a dog from within. The barking went on for a minute or two, then Bitsy faintly heard a woman's voice admonish the animal, and the dog, presumably Marcia's poodle, Fifi, shut right up. Whatever bad blood there may have existed between the twins, apparently Fifi hadn't picked up on it because when Ingrid opened the door, Fifi hovered protectively in the background, keeping a wary eye on Bitsy. Ingrid did not invite Bitsy in, which was not surprising. I just stopped by to say how sorry I am for your loss and to apologize for the misunderstanding, said Bitsy, holding out a bakery box of assorted cupcakes. She'd left the banana cream ones out. Thank you, said Ingrid and stiffly took the box out of Bitsy's hand. Ingrid was heavily made up, just as she had been when she visited the bake shop, and she was as heavily accessorized and bewigged as usual, but Bitsy felt something was missing. When Fifi sneezed in the background, Bitsy realized what it was. Ingrid wasn't wearing her trademark scent. Ingrid didn't smell of roses and baby powder and turpentine. She didn't smell of anything at all. In fact, the only thing Bitsy could smell was the faint scent of cupcakes and the strong scent of cinnamon and nutmeg. Are you baking? Bitsy asked. Do I smell an apple pie? Ingrid looked at her as if that were a silly question, which it was. There was nothing odd about a cookbook authoress who specialized in baked goods making an apple pie in her kitchen. 
Just because her twin sister had recently died a tragic death didn't mean the woman was no longer entitled to bake an apple pie. It's Peach, actually, said Ingrid. She still didn't invite Bitsy in, even after Bitsy craned her neck and gazed longingly into Ingrid's kitchen. Unlike Marcia's outdated kitchen, Ingrid's had trendy marble counters, custom cabinetry, and top-of-the-line appliances. Despite Bitsy's shameless hints, Ingrid did not suggest that Bitsy linger and have a piece of the delicious-smelling pie when it came out of the oven. Fifi, the poodle, had evidently decided that Bitsy posed no threat because the dog had flopped down at Ingrid's feet and was licking at her front paws. I just wanted to clear the air, said Bitsy, I know you believe that Marsha betrayed you by giving me your banana cream frosting recipe, but she really didn't. I never even had the pleasure of meeting Marsha. I just thought. Chapter 5 No apology is necessary, said Ingrid. Bitsy had expected to see a flash of anger in Ingrid's eyes when she brought up Marsha's supposed betrayal, but there was no hint of the irate woman who'd visited the bake shop. That day in the bake shop, Ingrid had appeared prepared to brawl with anyone who got in her way. The only bad vibes radiating off Ingrid now was her unmistakable desire that Bitsy go away and leave her alone. I just didn't want you to believe that your sister in any way betrayed you, Bitsy said. I don't. Ingrid had placed Bitsy's peace offering of cupcakes on a little bench in the entry and was twisting the hem of her flouncy apron and evading Bitsy's sigh. I have to go, said Ingrid. My timer is about to go off. There was nothing else Bitsy could do but leave. She'd barely turned her back on the front door when Ingrid pulled it shut and engaged the deadbolt. Bitsy had steeled herself to be yelled at or threatened by Ingrid, but she hadn't anticipated that the woman would pretend as if her irate scene in the bake shop had never happened. Bitsy couldn't help wondering if the woman was suffering from intermittent memory loss. Ingrid was a little on the young side to suffer from dementia, but it certainly wasn't unheard of. Perhaps, the stress of the death of her twin had triggered new or worsening symptoms. Before Bitsy returned home, she had one more visit to make. She retrieved the second box of cupcakes from her car and went next door to Todd McPherson's house. Todd was out in his front yard, trimming his hedge, when Bitsy hailed him from the street. I thought you might enjoy sampling a few cupcakes, she said as if she were in the habit of handing out boxes of cupcakes to random inhabitants of Little Creek. The truth was that the cupcakes were not a sample. They were a bribe. Bitsy wanted Todd McPherson to talk, and the likeliest way to get invited in for a chat was to offer him a present. Todd McPherson was a talker, and soon after sinking into one of the old wooden rocking chairs on his front porch and being presented with an enormous glass of sweet tea, Bitsy realized that the cupcakes had been entirely unnecessary. Todd McPherson was the type who waylaid the mailman and kept him from his route. It's a shame about Marcia, Bitsy said, eager to steer the conversation in the right direction before Todd got started on something entirely unrelated to the reason for her visit. He'd already gone into considerable detail on the weather and how unseasonably warm it was for still being April. It was only a matter of time before he moved on to fishing or bowling or whatever his hobby of choice was. It is a shame about Marcia, isn't it? Todd said. We've been neighbors for years. I'm just sorry I didn't find her sooner. She might have made it if I had. It was possible that this was true, but Bitsy didn't see any harm in trying to assuage Todd's survivor's guilt, so she said, it was my understanding that Marcia must have died almost immediately. It's hard to know, said Todd. But I take comfort in the fact that she can't have suffered long. I saw Joe delivering a new refrigerator to her house just half an hour before I found her, and I can't imagine that he wouldn't have heard her moaning or something if she'd still been alive. This was a new and troubling bit of information. Stan had implied that, based on the condition of the body, Marcia had been dead for hours by the time Todd had called 911 to report the discovery of Marcia's remains at the bottom of her basement stairs. Who is Joe? Bitsy asked. There was little chance of this Joe being any other than the one Bitsy had overheard talking to Marcia's niece Zoe in the basement, but she wanted to hear what Todd had to say about him. Joe's been doing some work for Marcia. Fixing things up around her house. There was no question that there were plenty of things around that house that needed fixing. It needed a whole new paint job for a start. Marcia had kept things neat as a pin, but there was no doubt the place was suffering from deferred maintenance. So, you think that Joe came to do some work on the house and left again without noticing anything was amiss? 
must have. And you said you smelled Ingrid's perfume in the basement. Yes, said Todd. What are you trying to get at? Surely, you don't think. Todd trailed off, unwilling to voice out loud any suspicion that Ingrid might have had anything to do with her sister's death. That was exactly what Bitsy did think, and now she was thinking that this Joe person might have been in on it, too. She didn't like to say it out loud either, however, so she changed the subject. Are Joe and Zoe friends, she asked Todd. Friends? Acquaintances, maybe. Zoe checks in on her Aunt Marcia pretty often, so I suppose she and Joe probably run into each other every once in a while. Joe and Zoe had sounded like far more than acquaintances when Bitsy had overheard their conversation in Marcia's basement, but she could hardly bring that up to Todd. What about Ingrid? What Bitsy meant to ask was if Zoe visited her Aunt Ingrid often, but Todd misunderstood her question. Joe does work for Ingrid, too, from time to time, said Todd. He recently redid her whole kitchen, and these old houses constantly have stuff going wrong with them. I've often thought of moving out to one of those new neighborhoods on the edge of town. You know that one that went in north of the post office? My friend Arnold says. Bitsy had no interest in what Todd's friend Arnold had to say, so she accidentally on purpose knocked over her glass of sweet tea. By the time Todd had gone back inside to get her another one and she'd mopped up the mess with the rag he brought her, Todd had forgotten all about his digression. At least Fifi had a place to go, said Bitsy before Todd had a chance to go off on another tangent. I just stopped by to see Ingrid, and Fifi seemed to be settling in with her very nicely. Really? I didn't expect that. In fact, I was shocked that Ingrid agreed to take Fifi after Marcia died. I kind of figured Zoe would end up with her. Why was that so surprising? Ingrid has never been fond of dogs, said Todd. She thinks they're dirty animals, and Fifi seems to sense it. Every time I see Fifi when Ingrid is around, well, that poodle is high-strung. It took her quite a while to warm up to me. Bitsy would not have described Fifi as high-strung. The poodle had seemed vigilant, but that was typical of dogs. Fifi had barked her little head off when Bitsy had stood outside Ingrid's front door, but as soon as Ingrid had informed the dog that there was nothing to fear, Fifi had settled right down. This did not square with Fifi not liking Ingrid. The animal clearly trusted her. Bitsy finished off her glass of sweet tea and sat through three back-to-back -back bass fishing stories before she told Todd she really must go or she'd be late for work. That wasn't really true. She did have to stop by the bake shop and pick up the cash from the day to deposit before the drive up at the bank closed, but after that, she and Nick were going out to dinner together. Bitsy wanted to go home and wash off the film of flour on her skin and the bits of batter that were doubtless stuck in her hair before she went out with Nick. She was already self-conscious about what people must think when they saw her and Nick together. Nick was 40 to Bitsy's 50 and very good-looking. Bitsy was entirely ordinary, although Nick didn't seem to see her that way. Still, she tried to make an effort when they went out together. During dinner, Bitsy avoided talking about the untimely demise of Marcia. She did not intend to tell Nick about her call on Ingrid or her visit with Todd. The only person she intended to tell that story to was Stan. Somehow, though, Nick sensed Bitsy was hiding something from him. You've been investigating again, he said as they sat at a back table at Pietro's Pizza and waited for the waitress to bring out their tiny stainless steel cups of complimentary spumoni to complete the meal. I might have been investigating again, Bitsy admitted. She wanted to justify her behavior by saying that the police were now viewing Marcia's death as suspicious, but she knew she shouldn't, not at Pietro's Pizza with who knew who sitting at the next table possibly listening in. The Little Creek police might be having their suspicions about the circumstances surrounding Marcia's death, but Stan had made it clear that Bitsy was to keep that information strictly to herself. Well, if you decide to go poking around and putting yourself in danger, Nick said, at least take me with you next time. I will, Bitsy promised, if there is a next time. There's always a next time, Nick said, then change the subject. Grandad wants you to stop by Shady Grove and see him at your earliest convenience. Did he say why? Bitsy always enjoyed her visits with Roscoe, and he always seemed happy to see her when she stopped in at the Shady Grove retirement home, but this request from Nick was unusual. Grandad wouldn't say what he wanted, Nick said. 
he just insisted that he had something to tell you that you would find interesting. Chapter 6 Bitsy didn't get over to see Roscoe until the following day at lunchtime. She arrived at Shady Grove to find Roscoe sitting in the dining room with a tray of what looked, to Bitsy, like a rather unappetizing meal. I brought you cupcakes, she told Roscoe as she set a box of a dozen banana cream cupcakes down on the table next to him. Oh, good, said Roscoe, I was hoping you'd bring me something better to eat. He lowered his voice before he continued, the food around here just gets worse and worse. Oh, I don't know, said an old man Bitsy didn't recognize who was sharing the table with Roscoe. I don't think it's that bad. That's because you've been widowed for the past 30 years and never learned to do anything for yourself, Roscoe said before he introduced Bitsy to his fellow resident. The man's name was George, Roscoe informed Bitsy, and he used to be a horse trainer before he'd retired at the age of 78. I do know how to cook, George protested. He knows how to use a can opener, Roscoe said under his breath. George must have been half deaf because he didn't seem to hear. Let's go to my room, Roscoe suggested. Aren't you going to offer George a cupcake? Bitsy asked as they exited the dining room. I don't give your cupcakes away for free, said Roscoe, and I don't waste them on the likes of George. He lacks the taste to appreciate them. You're not running a resale racket with my cupcakes, are you? Bitsy joked. I am not. I don't take cash for them. I trade them for favors. Bitsy suspected that more than a few of those cupcakes would go to whichever of the female residents had recently caught Roscoe's eye, not that such an effort was usually necessary for Roscoe to get any woman's attention at Shady Grove. You may trade some of them for favors, Bitsy told Roscoe, but I think you use most of them to flirt with the females. In Bitsy's estimation, Roscoe was probably the pick of the bunch, and besides, there were two women for every man amongst the residents of Shady Grove. The bar for being considered hot stuff in the masculinity department was rather low. Nonsense, I don't need cupcakes, Roscoe protested. I'll have you know my personal charm is sufficient to catch the eye of the ladies. Well, save a few to eat yourself, Bitsy told Roscoe. I always do. They were in Roscoe's room now. They sat down in the plush armchairs which faced the window, and Bitsy stared out at the spring breeze rustling the newly green leaves on the tree outside while she waited for Roscoe to spit out whatever it was he wanted to say. I understand you've mounted an investigation into Marsha Morrison's death? Roscoe finally said. Bitsy wouldn't have put it quite like that. I've just been poking around a little. How much do you know about the sweet and sour twins? Not a lot. Who in the world gave them that nickname? I did. You? I thought Nick might have mentioned to you that I went to school with the Morrison twins. Aren't they quite a lot younger than you? Bitsy wished she'd put the question more diplomatically, but Roscoe didn't take offense. I took classes with the sweet and sour twins at the Fayetteville Community College when I got out of the service. They were fresh out of high school, but I was well past 30 by then. All Nick mentioned was that you and Ingrid. Bitsy didn't know quite how to finish that sentence, but she didn't have to. Ingrid was sweet on me, said Roscoe. That was after Bertha passed away, of course. Bertha had died shortly after giving birth to Nick's mother, so there was nothing scandalous about that if one was prepared to overlook the considerable age gap. The way Nick had told it, Bitsy had gotten the impression that it was the other way around, but she wasn't about to question Roscoe's memory of who'd been sweet on who. That was a long time ago, said Bitsy. Have you maintained a friendship with the Morrison twins since then? I wouldn't characterize it as a friendship, said Roscoe, but I'd say we've all taken an interest in each other's doings over the years. What doings? Well, you've probably already heard that there was a vicious rivalry between those two. Nobody has yet characterized it as vicious, but yes, several people have mentioned there was bad blood between Marcia and Ingrid. It started way back in our college days, said Roscoe. They'd compete over everything, even men. Including you. Roscoe nodded. What happened? Marcia showed an interest in me, in her own quiet way. And as soon as Ingrid figured that out, she threw herself at you? Bitsy surmised. Something like that. Surely, those two weren't fighting over men right up into their sixties? 
They probably were, said Roscoe, but I believe the main source of the bitterness between them was due to Ingrid's career as a TV personality. I thought Ingrid was mainly a cookbook authoress. She was that, too, Roscoe said. But there were about ten years there where Ingrid was constantly going on morning shows and things like that to show off her baking skills. And Marcia was jealous. Yes, but there was more to it than that. Oh. Marcia claimed that Ingrid couldn't bake a cake to save her life and that Ingrid was a complete and utter fraud. Marcia once told me that every recipe in Ingrid's books had been made up, not by Ingrid, but by Marcia. Do you believe that's true? I don't know. If it was true, then how did Ingrid manage to keep getting recipes out of her sister? That I don't know. It seemed like to me that Ingrid had some sort of dirt on Marcia, and that's how she got her twin to keep up the charade. Marcia wasn't keeping very quiet about it, not if she was complaining to you. Marcia was one of those people who gets too talkative when they drink. How often did Marcia drink? Based purely on her house, Marcia didn't seem much like a drinker to Bitsy, but maybe Marcia had been a closet imbiber. I only saw Marcia drunk once, at Bobby Potts' New Year's Eve party in 1998, said Roscoe. That's when she told me all about how Ingrid was a fraud. That was over 20 years ago, said Bitsy. A lot could have changed between those two since then. I wouldn't count on it, said Roscoe. It's been my observation that bitterness festers. That had been Bitsy's observation, too, and coupling what she knew of human nature with Ingrid's accusations that Marcia had stolen her banana cream frosting recipe and given it to Bitsy, there was compelling evidence to suggest that the twins were feuding right up to Marcia's last breath. Bitsy just hoped that Ingrid hadn't been the reason Marcia had breathed her last. I didn't see you at Marcia's funeral, Bitsy told Roscoe. I was there. The Shady Grove bus brought a few of us over for the service. The bus was late in leaving, and we ended up sitting in the back row. I sat next to George. He cried the whole time. That explained why Bitsy hadn't seen Roscoe at the funeral. Did George know Marcia, or is he just a highly sensitive soul? George knew both of them, but I'm not sure how. He was so broken up over Marcia's death that I didn't like to pry. I'm guessing some love triangle gone wrong. Marcia and Ingrid were always sparring over men. By the sounds of it, this, sparring over men, as Roscoe put it, seemed to consist mostly of Marcia falling for someone and having Ingrid try and steal the man away. What do you know about Zoe? Bitsy asked Roscoe. Zoe? Zoe is Marcia and Ingrid's niece. She was sitting next to Ingrid at the funeral. She was tall and thin with red hair. I suppose I've seen her, but we've never had a conversation. I think she moved to Little Creek just a few years back. What about Joe? Bitsy asked. Joe who? Bitsy realized that she didn't even know Joe's last name. He was a handyman who was doing work for Marcia. The neighbor saw him delivering a refrigerator to the house the morning Marcia died. Bitsy decided not to mention that there had been no sign of any new refrigerator in Marcia's house, just the box cut up in pieces in the basement. She had her theories about that, but she wasn't ready to reveal them. The guilty party, or parties, must have no inkling they were under suspicion until Bitsy had more proof to support her theory. Never heard of Joe the Handyman, said Roscoe. Bitsy hung around for a while after that, chatting about this and that. When she finally took her leave of Roscoe and headed back to the bakery, the lunch rush was over. It was that long mid-afternoon stretch when there were few customers, and she could get all the finishing touches put on the pans of cupcakes that Hector had baked that morning. When the after-work crowd stopped by, they'd be ready. Except she didn't have a chance to frost any cupcakes because no sooner had she put on her hairnet and tied her apron when she was interrupted by an unexpected visitor. Chapter 7 Bitsy was just taking a bowl of banana cream frosting out of the refrigerator when Nick stuck his head into the kitchen and said, there's someone out here to see you. Who is it? She says her name is Zoe. When Bitsy came out of the kitchen, wiping her hands dry on the front of her apron, Zoe was pretending to examine the contents of the bakery case, but it was obvious she was ogling Nick. It occurred to Bitsy that perhaps Zoe had not actually asked to see her, but that it had been Nick who had decided that Bitsy was a better person to deal with Zoe. When Bitsy introduced herself, Zoe extended her hand and said, 
I sampled a couple of those cupcakes you dropped by for my Aunt Ingrid. They were delicious. All the while she talked to Bitsy, Zoe's eyes were following Nick's retreat into the kitchen. Bitsy wouldn't have been shocked to find out that Ingrid had dumped her peace offering straight into the trash can, but apparently, she had not. I'm so glad you liked them, Bitsy said. I'm hosting a baby shower for a friend of mine, Zoe said. I was wondering if you could do some themed cupcakes for me. I don't see why not. What's the theme? Under the sea. Bitsy wanted to make some crack about supposing that the mother-to-be would be opting for a water birth, but she bit her tongue. I have some toppers I'd like to use, said Zoe, reaching into her purse and pulling out what could only be described as a bag full of mutilated plastic mermaids. At least that's what Bitsy presumed they were. Only the lower bodies of the poor creatures were visible. I was thinking that the mermaids could dive into billows of frosting. Zoe held one of the mermaid tails upside down. Put that way, the notion was a little less disturbing, and Bitsy suggested that she could use a drift of confectionery spray in seafoam green and a bit of edible sparkle to enhance the wave effect. I knew you'd understand my vision, said Zoe. How many cupcakes would you like me to make? Bitsy asked. Ten dozen. Zoe's expectant friend must be very popular, greedy for gifts, or both. It's a whole family party, Zoe said. I see. What kind of flavor would you like the cupcake itself to be? By the time they'd settled on a mixture of plain pound cake, cherry vanilla, and blueberry, Zoe was downright chummy. When would you like to pick them up? Bitsy asked. Can't you deliver? Zoe asked. What about Nick? Over her dead body, Bitsy wanted to say. She was temporarily regretting her decision to have the staff wear name badges. We don't really have the staffing for that, Bitsy explained. Every once in a while, we're able to accommodate, but it's not part of our regular service. Would you be a doll and deliver? Zoe wheedled, patting Bitsy's arm. Zoe had a way about her that raised Bitsy's hackles and several red flags. She did not like it when virtual strangers tried to get pushy by pretending that they were already fast friends. Where is the shower? Bitsy asked, stalling for time. If, and it was a big if, she decided to make the delivery, she'd ask Annabel to do it and give her a generous bonus for her trouble. It's at Aunt Ingrid's house, said Zoe. Of course, we'd be happy to deliver, said Bitsy. She wasn't going to send Annabel out on this delivery. She'd do it herself, and, against her better judgment, she would take Nick with her. For one thing, he'd made it clear he was going to be unhappy with her if she persisted in carrying on investigating Marcia's unfortunate demise on her own. She also wanted backup because she intended to snoop, and Nick would be the perfect person to distract Ingrid and Zoe while she did it. When is the shower? Bitsy asked. Tomorrow evening at 7. I'll need you there by 6.30. That was awfully short notice, but Bitsy took three bags full of plastic mermaid tail cupcake toppers from Zoe and wrote down her order on a form. We'll make sure you get your cupcakes, Bitsy assured her. Bitsy did not promise to have the cupcakes there by 6.30. She and Nick were going to be late, very late. There was nothing like a couple of hostesses frantically trying to make up for lost time to distract them from a delivery person going astray in the house after asking permission to use the powder room. The following afternoon as Bitsy frosted and seafoamed and sparkled the edible waves and stuck on the mermaid tails, she had to admit that the cupcakes were not quite as horrifyingly hideous as she had imagined they would be. They had a certain charm. She still wasn't on board with the whole undersea theme for a baby shower, but perhaps, that was how expectant mothers did things these days. Bitsy hadn't been an expectant mother for 26 years since her pregnancy with her only daughter, Emily. Emily, who lived in Dallas with her husband, was herself expecting. Although, when Emily's best friend threw her a baby shower, the hostess restricted herself to the traditional teddy bears and gender-neutral yellow. Emily and Bradley hadn't yet revealed if the baby was going to be a boy or a girl. Bitsy was trying, unsuccessfully, to keep her own curiosity tamped down, although she'd refrained from repeatedly questioning the mother and father-to-be about it. When Bitsy had asked Nick to accompany her to deliver the cupcakes, he'd reluctantly agreed, but when they were in Bitsy's car heading over to Ingrid's with a back seat full of cupcake boxes, 
Bitsy had revealed that she intended to snoop while she was there. Can't you leave the poor woman alone? Nick asked. Her sister just died. Let her grieve in peace. Bitsy didn't believe there was much grieving going on, but perhaps she was being unfair to the surviving twin. Still, knowing what she knew, Bitsy couldn't just let matters rest. If you'd told me that a week ago, I'd have been forced to agree with you, said Bitsy. It was just a hunch then, but now I have evidence. What evidence? Ingrid was in Marcia's house that morning, and so was Joe, the handyman. According to who? According to the neighbor who found Marcia at the bottom of the basement stairs. Bitsy's phone dinged. It was Zoe, asking after the cupcakes. It was the third text Bitsy had gotten from her since 6.32. It was now 6.48. If anyone should be under suspicion, it's the person who found Marcia, Nick said. Why? Because he was the one who found her. She was already cold. That's when he called it in, but who's to say? I don't believe he had anything to do with it, Bitsy insisted. I don't believe anyone did, said Nick. Marcia Morrison just fell down some stairs and hit her head. It's sad, but accidents happen. I'm not saying an accident didn't happen, said Bitsy. I'm just, well, something's definitely not right. I see. Nick clearly didn't see. Todd says he saw Joe the handyman delivering a new refrigerator to Marcia's house that morning, said Bitsy. So? There's no new refrigerator in that house, just the box, cut up in pieces in the basement. I'll admit that's odd, but what does that have to do with Ingrid? Todd says Ingrid was in the house that morning, too. He saw her? Todd didn't see Ingrid, he smelled her. Really? The neighbor smelled Ingrid, Bitsy told Nick, and don't say that's impossible because you can't have forgotten that noxious cloud of rose perfume surrounding her when she came to the bake shop. Nick admitted that he had not forgotten. I still don't think that's very much to go on, he said. And that's not all, said Bitsy. Marcia's poodle is acting weird. How so? When I went over to see her after the funeral, the dog seemed perfectly happy with Ingrid. And that's weird? Why? Todd told me that Marcia's poodle hates Ingrid's guts, and the feeling is mutual. The neighbor, again? Did it occur to you that he may be feeding you a pack of lies? Why would he do that? Maybe, he had something to do with Marcia ending up dead at the bottom of her basement stairs. Weren't you just insisting that Marcia's death couldn't possibly be anything other than a freak accident? Nick shut up after that, but he wasn't happy. Neither was Bitsy. She and Nick rarely got angry with each other, and his moody silence made her edgy. She'd have much rather he continued to argue with her. When they pulled up at the curb, Bitsy said she was going in with or without him. If he was coming with her, his job was to distract Zoe, and especially Ingrid, while Bitsy excused herself to use their powder room. Zoe flung open Ingrid's front door before Bitsy even had time to ring the bell. Chapter 8 Where have you been? Zoe demanded. The guests are starting to arrive. Zoe was right. Two cars had already pulled up at the curb behind Bitsy's little hatchback. Where shall we put these boxes? Nick asked Zoe. Zoe seemed to realize for the first time that Nick was present. She turned the hiss into a purr and informed him that he could put the cupcakes anywhere he wanted. It was all Bitsy could do to keep the smile pasted on her face. Bitsy and Nick made two more trips back and forth, with boxes until all the cupcakes were inside. By this time, it was after 6.30. More guests had arrived, and to placate Zoe and by herself time, Bitsy suggested that Nick might help set the cupcakes out on the platters on the refreshment table. Can I use your powder room? Bitsy asked Ingrid, who seemed rather overwhelmed by the influx of guests. I'm having some stomach trouble. That should stave off inquiry into her whereabouts for a while. Very few people are inclined to rush anyone who has preemptively admitted to having stomach trouble. Up the stairs, and to the right, said Ingrid. It's right on the landing, you can't miss it. Bitsy practically scampered up the stairs. She wondered where Fifi was. She didn't want to go poking around and startle the animal into a frenzy of barking. 
It would be hard to explain why she'd disturbed the dog on the way to the bathroom. At the top of the stairs, Bitsy found the bathroom off the landing, just as Ingrid had instructed her. The door was ajar. Bitsy turned on the light, the exhaust fan, and the faucet, hoping to convince anyone who came upstairs that she was inside. After that, she crept down the hallway, keeping a sharp ear out for Fifi, who must have been shut up somewhere to keep her out of the way of the guests. If Fifi had been a larger animal, the poodle would probably have been put out in the backyard, but Bitsy had thought this unlikely, and she was right. There was only one door shut out of the six that opened onto the hallway, and Bitsy heard the plaintive whimpering of poor, imprisoned Fifi coming from behind the closed door. Bitsy hoped the poodle wouldn't trade whimpering for barking and howling. Bitsy crept down to the far end of the hall and started peeking in at open doors. A large airy room with a big bay window overlooking the front yard was clearly Ingrid's bedroom. The antique four-poster bed was neatly made up with a 1960s vintage quilted polyester sham and comforter set in a pink, orange, and lime green floral print. Although the bedroom was bursting at the seams with chotskis, the riot of knickknacks was free of dust and cobwebs. The vanity in the corner was covered in cosmetics and perfume bottles and more ceramic figurines. On the chest of drawers, a wig stand displayed two spare wigs, one identical to Ingrid's everyday blonde bouffant and another newer wig, styled in a sleek chestnut brown bob. Bitsy wandered over to the nightstand next to the bed and picked up the prescription pill bottle sitting next to a bottle of water. It was warfarin, which Bitsy recalled had been prescribed to her father after he had his first stroke. Had Ingrid suffered from a similar condition? Several filmy nighties with matching peignoirs, last fashionable in the 1970s, hung from a hook on the outside of the closet door. Bitsy peeked inside at the hanging clothes, but there was nothing there that piqued her interest. Bitsy was just coming out of Ingrid's bedroom when a car alarm from one of the cars parked out on the curb started going off, and Fifi began to howl. It was only a matter of time before someone came up to try and calm down the hysterical dog, so Bitsy darted into the bathroom and shut herself inside. She had just locked the door behind her and turned off the tap when she heard Ingrid's voice calling out to Fifi as she passed by in the hall. Shortly afterward, Bitsy heard a door open and shut, and the howling stopped. Bitsy soundlessly pulled open the medicine cabinet and looked inside. There was nothing there of note unless one was prepared to be surprised that a woman in her late sixties used roll-on deodorant, cotton swabs, and suffered from foot fungus. Bitsy moved on to the hamper next to the bathtub. That was more interesting. Inside was an assortment of Ingrid's signature over blouses in bold prints and metallics, along with an array of coordinating stretch pants. Near the bottom, however, Bitsy came across a pair of threadbare blue and yellow plaid flannel pajamas. Bitsy would have thought the pajamas belonged to some gentleman caller of Ingrid's who stayed overnight on occasion, but the pajamas were awfully small to belong to any man. They would have been a perfect fit for Ingrid herself. Are you all right in there? Nick said as he rapped on the door to the bathroom. I'm fine. I'll be out in a second. When Bitsy and Nick went back downstairs, the shower was in full swing, but Ingrid was nowhere to be seen. Let's get out of here, said Nick as he steered Bitsy toward the front door in a furtive manner. Was Zoe happy with the cupcakes? Bitsy asked as Nick closed the front door behind them. Other than the fact the cupcakes arrived half an hour late? Yes, she seemed to be. That's good, then. Well, don't ever ask me to make a delivery there again. Why? Let's just say I had to keep moving to avoid unwanted advances? From Ingrid? She was joking, but Nick was in no mood for any attempts at levity. They'd reached Bitsy's car, and Nick paused as he put on his seatbelt to look at Bitsy like she'd lost her mind. Ingrid was nothing but polite, Nick said. Zoe was the problem. She needs a man in her life. I think Zoe does have a man in her life, said Bitsy, the problem is that he already belongs to somebody else. Which was probably why Zoe was looking for a backup. In Zoe's defense, she likely had no idea that Nick was taken, but any woman with half a brain and a reasonable measure of consideration for the feelings of others should have realized that her attentions were unwelcome. What are you talking about? I'd rather not go into it. That woman has a problem, said Nick. Bitsy hoped that Zoe's problems were confined to making unwanted advances towards strange men and engaging in affairs with other people's husbands. 
Still, Bitsy was very much afraid that Zoe's morally suspect behavior might not be confined to an unwillingness to keep her hands to herself. Tuesday of the following week was Liz's birthday. Bitsy and Nick met Stan and Liz at a restaurant in Fayetteville to celebrate. We have more than one thing to celebrate, said Liz, as Bitsy handed her sister-in-law a wrapped gift. The sale of the new house went through today. We picked up the keys and everything. So soon. Bitsy asked. That seems awfully quick. She looked over at Stan, who silently shook his head at Bitsy outside his wife's line of vision. Bitsy realized that Liz had no idea that the police were asking questions about the circumstances surrounding Marsha's death. Bitsy wondered if she was the only person outside the Little Creek Police Department who knew that all was not as it seemed when it came to the death of Marsha Morrison. Of course, Bitsy herself didn't know much. The police were suspicious, but why she didn't know. Bitsy did, however, know why she was suspicious, and the sale of the house was the perfect chance to orchestrate an opportunity to interrogate one of her suspects. When are you moving in? Bitsy asked. As soon as possible, said Liz. We had Zoe list our current place for sale. It goes on the market tomorrow. Of course, there's a lot that needs doing to the new place. And I have the perfect man for the job, said Bitsy. Who's that? Stan asked, seeming to sense that Bitsy was up to something. Joe Latimer, said Bitsy. He's been doing work on that house off and on for years, so he'll be perfect to help you get that place in shape. After visiting Roscoe and realizing that she didn't even know Joe's last name, Bitsy had done a little research on Joe. His last name was Latimer. He'd run a one-man remodeling business for the past five years. His ad in the local paper, which Bitsy ran across by chance, advertised him as being willing to take on any job regardless of size. No job too large or small, the ad said. Joe had a wife of 10 years named Kristen. As far as Bitsy could tell, they had no children, which had come as a relief to her because she had a terrible feeling that one way or another, Joe and Kristen's marriage was destined to fall apart. In short order, Joe and Kristen's marriage did fall apart, just not for any reason, Bitsy could possibly have anticipated. Chapter 9 Before Liz even had a chance to call the number Bitsy had given her at her birthday dinner, Joe Latimer was dead. The first Bitsy heard about Joe's death was the morning after Liz's birthday dinner. Bitsy was in the bake shop kitchen with Annabelle. They were doing the morning bake again. Hector's daughter was recovered, but now his son was sick, and his wife's employer couldn't do without her. Bitsy had assured Hector that they could manage without him, but at 7 a.m., with dozens of cupcakes still left to bake, she wasn't so sure. Bitsy was so sleepy she needed something to keep her awake, so she and Annabelle listened to the radio while they poured the batter into the pans. Bitsy was just using a spatula to scrape the last of the cherry vanilla cupcake batter from the mixing bowl when the voice coming over the airwaves said, Breaking news, early this morning, fishermen discovered a man's body at Brinks Lake. The cause of death is reported to be a single gunshot wound to the head. The identity of the victim is being withheld pending notification of next of kin. That was it. The cheerful voice on the radio went on to talk about the upcoming Azalea Blossom Festival and the proposed municipal bond to replace the city pool. Did you hear anything about that shooting at the lake? Bitsy asked Annabelle when she returned from the storeroom with a roll of paper towels. No. There was a shooting. Some guy got shot out by Brinks Lake, or at least that's where they found the body, Bitsy said. Who was it? They didn't say. The announcer hadn't said, but Bitsy had such a foreboding feeling about the victim's identity that she couldn't resist calling up Stan, although she waited until the clock over the utility sink clicked over to 7.30. What is it, Bitsy? Stan said sleepily when he picked up. That was Joe who got shot out at the lake, wasn't it? Someone got shot out at the lake? Some fishermen found a body out at Brinks Lake early this morning. Oh. You didn't know? Why should I know? I haven't been to the station for three days. I certainly haven't been there this morning. I'm supposed to be retired, you know. Bitsy supposed it was unreasonable to expect that the Little Creek Police Department should keep one of their semi-retired reserve officers perpetually informed of every little thing that went on in the town. 
still, a murder could hardly be described as a little thing. I'll call you back later if I hear anything, said Stan. Okay. Bitsy was about to hang up when Stan said, why should you think it's Joe? I had a lot of questions for him. You had a lot of questions for Joe, and that's why you think he got murdered? Yes. What kind of questions? I intended to ask him where he was and what he was doing right after he delivered that refrigerator to Marsha Morrison's house on the morning she was found dead at the bottom of her basement stairs. You think he had something to do with Marsha's death? No, I think he had something to do with Ingrid's, Bitsy told her brother. What? I think Joe Latimer had something to do with Ingrid Morrison's death. I think you mean Marsha Morrison, Stan insisted. No, I mean Ingrid. Did something happen to Ingrid that I don't know about? Stan sounded a little alarmed. Yes. When? I haven't heard about this. What I mean is, Bitsy broke off. It's too early to be having this conversation before I've even had coffee, said Stan. Come over for breakfast. I think Liz is frying up some bacon. Bitsy felt bad leaving Annabel all alone to get the last of the cupcakes in the oven, but tipping Stan off to her suspicions seemed too urgent to let wait. I'll be back in an hour, Bitsy told Annabel. When Bitsy arrived at Liz and Stan's, her brother was sitting at the kitchen table, clutching a cup of coffee. He didn't look overly happy to see her. Bitsy helped herself to some bacon and eggs from the skillet on the stove and sat down across from her brother. Where's Liz? she asked. Taking a shower. Good, because the fewer people who know what I'm about to tell you, the better. Stan sighed, but he didn't tell her to shut up and eat her bacon, so Bitsy forged ahead. Keep in mind, she told her brother, that what I'm about to tell you is based purely on circumstantial evidence. I was counting on that, said Stan. I think Marcia is still alive, said Bitsy. Then who is that buried under the gravestone with Marcia Morrison's name on it out behind the Little Creek Baptist Church? Surely you aren't saying that the casket was empty when they put it in the ground? I saw Marcia Morrison's dead body with my own eyes, and so did the coroner. There's no question she was dead, in fact. I'm not saying that one of the Morrison twins isn't dead, said Bitsy. I'm just 80% certain that Ingrid isn't Ingrid anymore. You think Marcia is still alive, and Ingrid is the one who's dead? Stan said. He was looking at his sister like she'd gone half insane. Bitsy had to admit that her theory, while supported by several strong pieces of circumstantial evidence, might sound bizarre when hearing it for the first time. I think Ingrid died, whether as the result of an accident or natural causes or homicide, and Marcia decided to take the opportunity to swap lives with her more glamorous twin. You think Marcia murdered her own sister just so she could pretend to be her? Stan asked. No, I don't, actually. I think impersonation was a crime of opportunity. And what makes you think that Marcia is impersonating Ingrid? Bitsy went over the evidence, Fifi the Poodle's seemingly sudden affection for a woman known to hate dogs, Ingrid's apparent forgetfulness about her accusations that Bitsy had stolen her banana cream frosting recipe, and Zoe's abrupt chumminess with her least favorite aunt. Also, I found a pair of pajamas in Ingrid's laundry that looked a lot more like they belonged to Marcia, said Bitsy. You can't go around rifling through people's dirty laundry, Bitsy, said Stan. Not without a warrant. I can, said Bitsy. You can't. Stan clearly didn't believe her yet, but he was still willing to listen, so Bitsy presented her last piece of evidence that Marcia had switched identities with her dead twin. I believe that Joe was involved in moving the body, said Bitsy. Ingrid's body? Yes, I believe that Ingrid died somewhere else, her house, most likely. I think Joe was recruited to move the body to Marcia's. Marcia's next-door neighbor saw Joe delivering a new refrigerator, or at least a refrigerator box, to Marcia's house earlier during the same morning Marcia's neighbor found her body at the bottom of the basement stairs. Maybe he really was delivering a refrigerator? Stan said. I doubt it, Bitsy insisted. There's no new refrigerator in that house, and there's more. But just then, Liz came into the kitchen, and Bitsy clammed up. She could tell Stan all about the baby oil and the smears of color on the dirty paper towels later. 
Bitsy suspected the baby oil had been used to remove the makeup from Ingrid's face to make her more closely resemble her plain Jane's sister. The revelation that Ingrid's earring was hiding under the bottom step in Marcia's basement would also have to wait until some other time. Stan didn't quite believe her yet, but Bitsy had a plan to confirm her suspicions. She had at her disposal an expert on the Morrison twins, and she intended to make full use of his knowledge. After finishing her plate of bacon and eggs, Bitsy hurried back to the bakery and helped Annabel finish up frosting enough cupcakes to fill the case out front, said a hasty hello to Nick, who had arrived in her absence, then headed over to Shady Grove Retirement Home to have a word with Roscoe. She found him in the dining room, staring moodily at a plate of rubbery scrambled eggs and scorched toast. I have a little something I'd like you to do for me, Bitsy said after Roscoe pushed his plate away and declared the breakfast inedible. I'll treat you to breakfast at Bub's Diner. On the drive over, I can tell you what I have in mind. Safely inside her little hatchback, Bitsy broke it to Roscoe that she believed Marcia was very much alive and pretending to be Ingrid. When she repeated her evidence, she got a more enthusiastic response from Roscoe than she had from her brother. I can find out for sure, said Roscoe. If I bring up a certain incident from the old days, I'll know immediately if it's Ingrid or Marcia I'm dealing with. I was hoping you could find out if Ingrid is really Ingrid without letting on that you're suspicious, said Bitsy. I wouldn't want to put you in any danger. Why would I be in any danger? Roscoe protested. Marcia isn't capable of hurting a fly. Bitsy wasn't so sure about that. If Marcia really is pretending to be Ingrid, she's committing identity theft, and that's without even taking into consideration that she might have had something to do with her sister's death. Marcia didn't kill Ingrid, said Stan. That's impossible. If she didn't kill her, said Bitsy, she certainly took advantage of her death. Marcia didn't kill Ingrid, Stan repeated, but with slightly less conviction. Bitsy really didn't think Marcia had killed Ingrid either. She wasn't entirely convinced that anyone had. Still, she had a terrible feeling that the man found shot to death out at Brinks Lake would turn out to be Joe Latimer and that his death was likely somehow related to his involvement with the Morrison twins. Chapter 10 By mid-morning, Bitsy's fears had been realized. As she was paying the bill for Roscoe's breakfast at Bub's Diner, she got a text from Stan. You were right. At first, Bitsy wasn't sure if Stan was referring to her suspicions about one of the Morrison twins impersonating the other, but a second text from Stan cleared up that confusion. It was Joe they found out at the lake. After Bitsy dropped Roscoe off at the entrance of Shady Grove, she pulled into a parking space under a shade tree and called Stan. What do you know about Joe? she asked as soon as her brother picked up. Not much, Stan said, and what I do know, I shouldn't be telling you, but most everything I tell you will be all over the news in a few hours, so I guess there's no harm in filling you in now. Does Joe's wife know? Yes, and I'm glad that it wasn't my job to tell her. Bitsy didn't envy the officer who'd had to break it to Kristen Latimer that her husband was dead. All the radio said this morning was that the victim had been found out at Brinks Lake dead from a gunshot to the head. That pretty much sums it up, said Stan. Joe was found sitting in the driver's seat of his pickup, slumped over his steering wheel, dead from a single gunshot wound in his temple. By the sounds of it, it was more of a point-blank execution-style shooting than anything. The shooter couldn't have been more than six feet away. There's no chance it was a suicide? Not a chance. There was no weapon recovered at the scene. Was the truck locked? No, and the windows were down. As if someone walked up to the truck and shot him through the window? Possibly, said Stan. It's hard to draw conclusions from that, but there was no sign of a struggle. It seems like it must have happened before that big rain during the night because both the body and the inside of the truck were soaking wet. From blowing rain? That's the logical conclusion. Did Joe have his fishing gear with him? Bitsy asked. I have no idea, said Stan. Is that significant? Bitsy wasn't sure if it was, but she wanted to know anyway. Look, Stan continued, I know you think there's something shady going on with the death of Marcia Morrison, but Joe Latimer really was murdered, and we don't know why, so I'd advise you to be very cautious about poking your nose in where it isn't wanted when it comes to Joe. Bitsy fully intended to be very cautious, but she knew she wouldn't be able to resist poking her nose in where it wasn't wanted. 
There was probably no one, save Ingrid slash Marcia, who wanted less to speak to Bitsy than Zoe Morrison did, but that was exactly what Bitsy intended to do. First, however, she intended to track down another potential untapped source of information. Before she went back to the bakery, Bitsy called Pietro's Pizza and ordered a large cheese, olive, and pepperoni thin crust pizza delivered to her house. Then she went home to wait for the delivery boy to bring it. The delivery boy turned out to be a delivery